This morning, we have two experimental talks, the first of which will be given by Dr. Ramesh Nath. He will talk about field-induced quantum phase transitions in one-dimensional spin-half Heisenberg antiferromagnets. So you have 35 plus five minutes. Okay. So good morning. So let me start with uh, thanking uh, uh, the organizers for inviting me for this uh, workshop. So today I'm going to talk about the fuel-induced quantum phase transition in one-dimensional spin-half Heisenberg antiferromagnetic chains. So I'll give you a brief introduction to 1D spin chains, followed by some examples where uh, uh, people have seen the singlet ground state and also the kind of field-induced uh, phase transitions that are, uh, occurs that occur in uh, you know 1D spin chains. And today, in particular, I'm going to talk about the sodium vanadium phosphate. I'll start from the synthesis. Uh, then we'll talk about the magnetic properties, uh, uh, heat capacity, uh, NMR, mu SR, and so on. All right. So, um, well, I think all of you know what is a quantum phase transition is. So it's quantum phase transition is nothing but a, a, a phase transition between two quantum phases when we are varying parameters like magnetic field, pressure, or chemical pressure, and so on. And such a phase transition is characterized by an abrupt change in the ground state properties you know, uh, of a many body system due to quantum fluctuations. And these quantum fluctuations are enhanced or you have huge quantum fluctuation when you go to a spin system with reduced dimensionality. For instance, in 1D spin chains, in particular the half integer spin chains due to enhanced quantum fluctuations, the nil antiferromagnetic ordering is forbidden down to zero temperature. Similarly, um, the integer spin chains, they have a gap in the excitation spectrum called Halden gap and so on. The moment there is an alternation of the exchange coupling in a spin half Heisenberg chain, that means when there is a deviation from the uniformity, so that will introduce a spin gap in the excitation spectrum. For instance, if you look at alternate spin chain, where actually this uh, extra interaction along the chain direction are alternating. So there is a small deviation from the uniformity. So that will essentially lead to a singlet ground state due to the spin dimension. Then you have a singlet ground state, you have a triplet excitation. So here the elementary excitations are spin one triplets. Even the spin ladders, if you look at the spin ladders, so even leg ladders also show a gap in the excitation spectrum. So these uh, spin gap systems are immune to perturbations. Uh, such as uh, interchain coupling, okay? So this uh, spin gap retains up to a threshold value of this interchain coupling. And above that threshold value, it transforms to a 3D long range ordered state, okay? So this external magnetic field also have a similar effect. So if you apply magnetic field, so what you are essentially doing is you are trying to close the gap. So at a particular field, the gap is closed then you will get a multitude of uh, field-induced phases. So one such field-induced phase is the bosons and condensation of the triplons. So when you are applying field, you know, at the critical field, uh, one of the speed state actually intercept the ground state, and that triggers a 3D long-range order, anti fermenting long-range order, which is of course uh, different from this classical order in many aspects, but it described well as the both signs and condensation of the triplons. And uh, this BEC phase is typically um, um, observed in uh, interacting dimer systems in three dimension or in two dimension. I mean, where the 3D or the 2D couplings dominate. A interesting a, or a very rich phase diagram has been predicted theoretically. This is the phase diagram. So these phases this phase occurs between two critical fields. This is SC1, that is the critical field of gap closing, and this is SC2, that is the uh, saturation field where you know, all the spins get polarized in the direction of the field. So you have a dome shaped phase diagram, and this is the XY uh, antiferromagnetic BC phase, as, and you have paramagnetic phase on the right side and the quantum disorder phase on the left side. So such a phase transition can be characterized you know, by fitting and this data close to the critical regime to a power law that is Tc uh, equal to a H minus Sc1 to the power phi. And this phi, that critical exponent phi, that essentially you know, 
reflect the universality class of the uh, phase transition. Uh, there are a few systems uh, very well studied in this respect. Uh, these are the systems with the, these are the spin gap, these are the spin gap values, the critical fields of gap closing and so on. And these are the phase diagrams that has been studied and so on. As you can see here in all these compounds, the critical fields, especially the saturation field is very high. So hence one requires a very high magnetic field in order to uh, you know, study this complete phase diagram. So uh, the other interesting aspect of this one distinction is the Tamunaga Lutinger liquid. Well, the Tamunaga Lutinger liquid can uh, universally describe the interacting particles in one dimension because your Fermi liquid uh, theory actually fails in 1D. So it's a non Fermi liquid type phase which emerges at the magnetic field driven by the quantum critical point. Okay, and this is typically observed in the 1D region or one dimensional region. So, so here, uh, I mean, uh, if you, the 1D spin chains or alternate spin chains or spin ladders, which are essentially coupled spin chains are predicted to show the signature of both PLL physics as well as the BEC physics. As you go to very low temperatures where the 3D coupling dominates, you'll have the uh, BEC type physics and a high temperature where you have purely one dimensional behavior, you'll get Thus, uh, uh, PLL behavior, the Tamunaga Lutinger liquid behavior. So, the, this is a phase diagram which is predicted theoretically. You know, this is your uh, exchange coupling along the y axis, and then this is the spin gap or the critical fields. So, on this uh, between SC1 and SC2, um, in the re temperature regime where 3D coupling dominates, you have the BC phase, and then above um, BC phase, you have uh, 1D regime, which is uh, TLL phase. Okay, so therefore, these uh, alternate spin chains are predicted to uh, kind of uh, show the signatures of both uh, BEC physics as well as the TLL physics, uh, which can enable, which may enable us to kind of study this crossover effect going from uh, 1D uh, TLL regime to 3D BEC regime. The other interesting features shown by these uh, spin gap systems uh, are like one is the magnetization plateau, which is uh, you know, were very well studied in this Sasti Sudalan lattice, tonsum copper boride, um, and uh, also the Wenger crystallization and so on. So all these quantum phase transitions occur between two critical fields, SC1 and SC2. So this experimental access to these two critical fields requires the appropriate design of materials with appreciably small spin gap and small exchange coupling so that one can explore the complete phase diagram using commonly available magnetic field and also can kind of uh, study all the field induced phenomena. So motivated by this, you know, we have been working on a series of vanadium phosphates uh, for a long time. And uh, here sodium, silver, vanadium, phosph uh, you know, uh, PO4 or AS4. Uh, instead of sodium, we have also used potassium, lithium, and so on, but they crystallize in a different structure. So the physics is completely different from the um, one, uh, one dimensional physics. So, but the, all these compounds, they crystallize in the same structure and the magnetism or the interactions are found to be almost uh, in the um, same type. So I'll start with the crystal structure. So this is the three dimensional view of the crystal structure. As you can see here, so this is this is VO6 octahedra. So please note that this is vanadium, it is four plus and it's spin half. So, so this VO6 octahedra, they are kind of corners here. They are forming a chain and this chain is going onto the page. So this is perpendicular or along the C direction. And uh, then there is a PO4 tetrahedra, which is uh, completely non-magnetic. They are also corners here with VO6 octahedra and forming a kind of three dimensional network. So a careful look, up the, look at the crystal structure uh, revealed that you know, the interaction um, between vanadium spins are found to be stronger along this extended path. This is via PO4 tetrahedra and they are forming J and J prime. So this J and J prime alt are alternating along the, this direction. Okay, so these are the spin chains which are separated by the uh, dashed lines. And uh, this corner sharing or the direct interaction by oxygen was found to be uh, found to result uh, a weaker interaction. 
Okay. So this is the skeleton of our spin lattice. So you can see here, this alternate spin chain. So in one plane, the spin chains are running parallel to each other. And then in the next, next plane, the chains are running perpendicular to each other. So they are making cross chains. And there are also interaction uh, within the chains, you know, that is J, A, and J, C. So we tried to grow single crystals and we failed uh, to grow crystals so far. And, um, you know, but then we decided to do the experiments on the polycrystalline sample. So, so this is the magnetic susceptibility of the polycrystalline sample. It shows a pronounced broad maximum at around, uh, well, I think 20 Kelvin or so, uh, which is due to the short range ordering due to uh, one dimensionality of the compound. With further decrease in temperature, it shows another broad hump around four Kelvin and then decreases, then again increases. So this low temperature increase is likely due to some kind of a tiny impurity or could be defects and so on. And to understand the second broad maximum, which is very unusual, we measured magnetic susceptibility at different fields. And we found that this peak is getting broad and broad as we increase the magnetic field, but the position remains same. So it's very unusual. So we don't know yet whether it's intrinsic to the sample or um, it's coming due to some impurities. But the sample quality was found to be very good from the powder XRD and other experiments, synchrotron and so on. So in order to extract the magnetic parameters, you know, we try to fit. Well, first we estimated the effective moment, which is found to be close to the spin half value. And then we fitted the magnetic susceptibility by this expression, chi equal to chi zero plus C impurity by T plus chi 1D. So this chi 1D is nothing but your you know, expression for spin susceptibility for a 1D spin half Heisenberg chain or alternate chain, which is valid over a very large temperature range. So it, it was given by Johnston et al. So you can see this solid line, it fits nicely to our experimental data and especially it reproduced the broad maximum region, you know, giving a exchange coupling J equal to 36.5 Kelvin and uh, J prime 35.77 Kelvin. So this suggests that, you know, there is a small alternation of the exchange coupling. So it is deviating slightly from the uniformity and which results in um, ratio of the exchange coupling or so alternation parameter alpha equal to 0 0.98, which is very close to one, close to a uniform uh, one dimensional spin chain. So such an alternation, as I have told you in the first slide, this such alternation would lead to a singlet ground state or spin dimeration. So therefore one should see a, a, a gap ground state. So in such a case, the magnetic susceptibility should exponentially you know, decrease to zero. But unfortunately due to some impurities or defect, we don't see such a exponential decrease. So instead we are showing, we're getting some upturn. So to prove this uh, spin gap, we measure um, magnetization M versus H at 0.5 Kelvin, okay, at very low temperatures, okay. As you can see here, it shows a broad hump here and then increases almost linearly at high fields. So this broad hump is likely due to this uh, impurities or defects. Now to subtract this contribution of the defects, we fitted it to a Brillouin function. This is the red line and then subtracted from the raw data. And then you can see here, this is the corrected magnetization. So magnetization remains zero up to almost 1.2 Tesla or 1.6 Tesla and then increases linearly. So this is a clear signature that, you know, we have a singlet ground state where the magnetization is zero and the gap is closed at uh, 1.6 Tesla, okay? And this 1.6 Tesla critical field, SC1, it's actually corresponds to a spin gap of two Kelvin, okay? Which is a very tiny spin gap between the singlet and your triplet excited states. Um, but here, here you can uh, see here that our measurements are limited up to seven Tesla in squid, but therefore we didn't get the saturation. So therefore we decided to use the magnetization using high field in pulse magnetic field up to 60 Tesla, but at 1.5 Kelvin above the spin gap. So it increases linearly then shows a pronounced curvature and then shows the tendency of saturation at around 57 Tesla. Well, I think this year I have normalized to one. Actually, we scaled this data and we found that this is going to one mu B, which is expected for a spin half. So this second critical field uh, is 57 Tesla, 
And assuming that it's a 1D spin chain compound, the exchange coupling J by KV is calculated to be 37.3 Kelvin, which is in a very good agreement with the one ex uh, extracted from the magnetic susceptibility. Okay. We also measure heat capacity. And uh, this, uh, well, uh, this, this uh, heat capacity analysis is a bit tricky because, you know, we didn't have a non magnetic analog in order to uh, subtract the phonon contribution. But nevertheless, we try to do some analysis using um, various models. So this is the raw data, the heat capacity. You know, at the high temperature, it's dominated by the phonons. At low temperature, you have some, you know, uh, broad maximum type weak, but broad maximum here, that's due to the strong magnetic correlations. Then we fitted it to a sum of dy model at high temperatures and subtracted the phonon contribution. And then this is the, your magnetic part, magnetic part of the heat capacity. So at the bottom panel, we have plotted C mag, that is the magnetic part of the heat capacity divided by temperature as a function of temperature. So here it also shows a broad maximum as is expected for a short range order, then a weak hump at around four Kelvin, then at low temperature, it decreases rapidly. So this uh, decrease is due to the opening of a spin gap. And again, the second broad hump could be an interesting feature of the sample. And uh, you know, this, uh, this uh, in heat capacity, the absolute value is very sensitive to the quantum fluctuations, okay? If you go to a 1D spin chain, where the quantum fluctuations are enhanced, so the absolute value is decreased compared to a, a two-dimensional square lattice, okay? So indeed, uh, in our case, the CMAG, the max absolute value of um, heat capacity is 2.8 Joule per mole Kelvin, which is very close to the value expected for a 1D spin chain, that is 2.9. So this suggests the system is 1D. And then the temperature corresponding to the broad maximum that reflects the energy scale of the exchange coupling or dominant antifermity exchange coupling. So now from the uh, T uh, temperature corresponding to the broad maximum, the leading exchange coupling is calculated to be 41 Kelvin, which is again consistent with our analysis or the assessment based on the magnetization, the magnetic susceptibility and magnetization. Well, now, and here I have summarized all the three compounds of this series. You know, they are exchange couplings and alternation parameter. They are zero spin, zero spin gap at zero field and the corresponding critical field of gap closing. Clearly, the sodium vanadium phosphate is the one which has a uh, weak alternation of the exchange coupling and a tiny um, spin gap with a small critical field. So because of this small critical field, it's an ideal system for field to kind of um, to explore the field induced phases. So therefore we measure magnetic susceptibility at different fields above the critical field of gap closing. So you can see here above 2.5 Tesla, it shows a slope change. Uh, it, this slope change is marked by the downward arrow. With increasing field, this position shift towards high temperatures. This suggests that there is a field induced transition and that field induced transition is moving towards high temperatures with uh, increasing magnetic field. But this effect is a bit weak. So in order to reconfirm this uh, uh, field induced phase, we measure heat capacity. Heat capacity above critical field to Tesla, it shows a pronounced lambda type anomaly and it's clearly shifting towards high temperatures. So that's a uh, you know, concrete uh, evidence of a field induced phase transition above the critical field of gap closing. We also did the band structure calculation in order to confirm the reliability or let's say the, um, uh, the exchange couplings, also the interchain couplings, which you could not estimate from our experiment and so on. And uh, these values apparently, you know, uh, found to be very consistent with our experiment. But there are still certain questions that uh, we are yet to, we are puzzled and uh, so on. One is uh, the analysis of KIT data is hampered due to the extrinsic contribution. We didn't see a direct, uh, direct, uh, you know, spin gap from the magnetic susceptibility where it is expected to decrease exponentially. Second one is the uh, in a hump in both heat capacity and uh, magnetic susceptibility at 4K. We don't know whether it is intrinsic to the sample, and uh, we also have uh, evidence from the bulk measurement that say uh, there is a field induced long range order, but it's always better to confirm using complementary experiments. So therefore, we decided to. Uh, uh, go for the phosphorus NMR in order to address some of these issues. So um, I 
uh, um, probably don't need to go uh, 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 in detail about the introduction to phosphorus NMR because we already had several talks by eminent people um, in the field of NMR. So, but I want to highlight here that, that what is the advantage of NMR in studying the spin system? Well, uh, the NMR actually, it measures both static uh, properties, static susceptibility, as well as the dynamic susceptibility. And uh, as far as the static part is concerned, you know, the NMR shift actually measures the spin susceptibility, which is completely free from impurities and defects. Okay, so therefore one can reliably, you know, uh, estimate the exchange coupling and other parameters, you know, using ma magnetic shift data rather than, you know, going for the bulk susceptibility, which is, which has several contribution, exchanging contributions. So that is one advantage. And second thing is by measuring NMR relaxation, one can get information about the dynamic susceptibility. Okay, so, so here actually, if you have a spin half nucleus, if you, you know, place in a static magnetic field, it will have G and splitting, you have a half and minus half states, so you have one allowed transition. So depending on the number of allowed transition in NMR, you will get um, the spectral lines. Okay, if it is a quadruple nucleus, then you will have a central transition and central peak, then uh, satellite peaks corresponding to the other uh, A transitions. So, uh, so here we did phosphorus NMR, which is a spin half nucleus. So we have only one allowed transition. Hence, uh, it is expected that uh, the spectra should be a single spectral line, the NMR spectra. So indeed, we have a single spectral line uh, of course, it is broad because of powder sample and it's magnetic. So you have one single spectral line and with a decreasing temperature, this uh, peak position, the resonance position of the sample shifts with temperature. It goes and then comes back. So this, uh, this vertical line, this is the um, resonance field of a non-magnetic reference sample, okay? Which would, uh, which would not shift with temperature. Okay, so this shift of this peak position with respect to this non-magnetic reference that is that gives you the NMR shift. Okay, so here we have plotted this NMR shift measure at two different fields as a function of temperature and which is a direct measure of the spin susceptibility and it's free from any impurities and defects. So it shows a pronounced broad maximum like susceptibility indicative of your short range order. Then again, it also shows a weak hump here okay, at around four Kelvin, suggesting that it could be intrinsic to the sample. It's not, um, it's not an extrinsic effect. And then at low temperature, you have some, uh, you know, um, some peak kind of thing because you have field induced transition at these fields, okay. So, um, so since NMR shift is a direct measure of the spin susceptibility, one can write NMR shift K, it's actually directly in terms of chi spin. This is the spin susceptibility and A is the proportionality constant. And this A is nothing but your hyperfine coupling of the phosphorus nucleus with the electronic spins, okay? Because we are sitting at the phosphorus side and probing uh, the spin side. So this A is uh, the coupling of, hyperfine coupling of the phosphorus nucleus with the uh, electro uh, vanadium spins. So therefore, and K is your chemical shift. So if you plot K versus chi with temperature as an implicit parameter, then, the slope of your linear fit will give you A. So here in the inset, we have plotted K versus sky, and you can see it's a nice straight line. And this linear fit gives you, gives us a hyperfine coupling of 6873 OS per mu B. That's the coupling strength of phosphorus with the vanadium spin. So now, as I said that, you know, one can get more reliable information, you know, doing uh, NMR shift analysis, and then your bulk measurement, bulk susceptibility measurement. So therefore we fitted this expression, taking chi spin for a alternate spin chain model, uh, you know, given by John Snedel. And then we fitted this expression to our data. The solid line is the fit. It very nicely reproduces the shape of this curve and also the broad maximum region, suggesting that it's a alternate spin chain compound. And the parameters were obtained to be this leading exchange coupling is found to be 39 Kelvin and alternation parameter alpha is found to be 0 0.98, which is very, which is in very good agreement with the value that we extracted from the magnetic susceptibility analysis. And here the G value uh, was fixed to 1.95. This was obtained from the uh, ESR experiments. 
So now this alternation parameter will give you the, uh, give you the, uh, or quantitatively to give you the, uh, in, uh, this thing, um, your uh, spin gap in zero field. So this is the expression delta zero equal to uh, this, uh, you know, and uh, uh, so that results in zero field spin gap of 2.37 Kelvin, which is slightly higher than the value we got from the magnetization analysis, because the, this, this formula apparently um, <laughs> overestimates the spin gap value because it doesn't take into account the interchain coupling. Okay, so, so this is confirmed that, uh, you know, it's alternate spin chain compound with a tiny spin gap. And uh, as I said that NMR spin lattice selection time, it's a measure of the dynamic, dynamic susceptibility on our T1 uh, can be written like this, where you sky double prime is the imaginary part of the dynamic susceptibility. And here AQ is the, um, um, I mean, hyperfine tensor. So, uh, so as you can see here, one over T1, we measure two different fields. At uh, high temperature, it is almost constant. And this is what I expected in the paramagnetic regime where you have random fluctuations of the moments. And then with decreasing temperature, it shows a linear region, probably due to the dominance of Q equal to zero contribution, the um, uniform contribution. And then at low temperature, it shows a increase or peak. So that is because likely due to your slowing down of the fluctuating moments as you are approaching the long range order state. So because of spin-spin correlations that actually diverging here, exponentially. And then at high fields, this peak position, the transition temperature is shifting, okay? And that is very good, that's, that's actually in uh, very, much, very, very good agreement with our uh, magnetic susceptibility and heat capacity measurements that we have a field induced magnetic long range order. Okay. Well, then we try to kind of summarize our compound uh, along with uh, various other studied compounds, uh, spin gap compounds or 1D spin chain compounds. So here we have uh, drawn a phase diagram um, like uh, spin gap versus magnetic field. And then uh, we have put all the compound uh, of this category in different, uh, uh, in, in their respective places based on their strength of the delta value. So this is the quantum critical point which separates the antiferromagnetic ordered state uh, from the spin gap state. So, you know, so here you have the compounds which shows the antiferromagnetic ordering and uh, left side the compound which is the uh, spin gap. So clearly our compound lies very close to the quantum critical point. So because of this, it's a tiny spin gap and it's proximate to proximity to the quantum critical point. So this is an ideal system to explore the field induced phenomena. So here we have drawn the phase diagram based on our experimental results. So this is the transition temperature and versus magnetic field. And this is the TN values we got from heat capacity, magnetic, magnetic susceptibility, magnetization and uh, NMR uh, uh, spin lattice relaxation time. So it, it traces a dome shaped phase diagram typically expected for the uh, bosons and condensation phase. Okay, so this is a 3D XY and deferromagnetic phase. So as I had told you previously, that see to characterize such a phase, we need to fit the power law to the data point in the in close to the critical point and find the exponent phi. We fitted here the critical regime. We took as t less than. 0.4 times Tn maximum. This is the Tn maximum here. Okay, so we try to fit as, as, you know, as close as possible to the kind of uh, to HC1. So um, uh, we found that the pi is close to 1.8. So theoretically, it is already reported that uh, for a BM BC page in 3D, the pi is close to 1.5, that is 3 by 2. And these are the compounds which have been kind of this number is verified. Even for the 2D system, that means the coupled spin dimers in two dimension that gives the pi value of one. So our value of 1.8 is very close to the 3D uh, or the value expected for a BEC page in three dimension. Okay. How much time I am left with? 10 minutes? Okay. Okay. So now the, the other uh, interesting aspect of this uh, one diff uh, this thing is this tomona, the concept of tomonaga lutingal uh, liquid, you know, or the framework of uh, TLL um, uh, physics, 
I can describe the interacting particles uh, or give universal description to the interacting particles in 1D, right? So now next we thought of kind of exploring this part and to see whether we have any signature of uh, this PLL physics. So th this is the critical field of magnetization, you know, SC1 and this is SC2. So the first thing that what we did is we plotted the derivative of d dm by dh as a function of h. So it shows two rounded maximums at the critical field. So this is the first signature that we have uh, a regime where we can see the field induced phases and, uh, and these two critical fields uh, essentially uh, suggest uh, the transformation into and out of this DLL regime. If you measure such a, you know, M versus H at very high temperatures and plot dm by dh versus h, it will always give you one rounded maximum, okay? So this is first indication of this TLL regime. The other, you know, striking feature that we see is in the heat capacity. So this is the magnetic part of the heat capacity as a function of temperature. Uh, so in the gapless regime that is above your TN, this is the 1D regime. So you have a linear uh, temperature regime, you know, and uh, very interestingly, this regime, the heat capacity is field independent. You can see three Tesla to 14 Tesla is all field independent. So that's a robust signature of the TLL physics, okay, or TLL regime, okay. So um, this uh, in this framework of this uh, TLL uh, TLL theory, you know, one can uh, describe uh, this uh, TLL physics using uh, two uh, parameters. One is called the renormalized velocity of excitation U and the other is dimensionless interaction parameter K. And this K uh, reflects um, or it can give you the information about the nature of the interaction of the, uh, you know, spinless fermions in the TLL regime, okay? Uh, also, it will tell you the inversality class of the spin system. So, uh, so the first crucial parameter that we used here is the Wilson ratio. So this Wilson ratio is, uh, is simply a dimensionless quantity, which a, a, which is uh, nothing but your the ratio of uh, temperature independent susceptibility uh, with um, uh, of uh, temperature independent susceptibility and the linear coefficient of the heat capacity. Okay, and this quantifies the spin fluctuation, which uh, is responsible for the enhancement of the magnetic susceptibility. Okay, and theoretically, it is already proved that in the TLL state, this uh, um, Wilson ratio is equal to 4K. So this enables us kind of directly estimate K, you know, using our experimental susceptibility and the heat capacity data. So what we did is we, uh, we took uh, the susceptibility from the D dm by dh curve here, and then uh, C by T coefficient from the linear fit here, then calculated the, um, sorry, uh, Wilson ratio and then K. So here we have plotted K as a function of magnetic field. It's almost field independent, okay? And it is less than one, okay? So it is already predicted theoretically that, you know, this when the value of K is less than one, the interaction um, between the spinless fermions is repulsive in nature. And if it's more than one, it is attractive in nature. And this has been already verified in some of the spin ladder compounds, where it is found that this kind of repulsive interaction, you know, um, is found uh, in the strong leg spin ladder compound, for example, this, and this attractive interaction is found in the strong uh, wrong ladder compounds. Okay, but also it is predicted that this repulsive interaction can also be observed in the bond alternate spin chain compound like ours, but experimentally it was not proved anywhere. So the other TLL parameter, so th that means uh, it's our case, it's T and a K less than one is indicative of the repulsive interaction between the spinless fermions. So the other uh, parameter that characterizes this uh, TLL physics is U, right? So the magnetic heat capacity is inversely proportional to U in the linear regime. So uh, we, we did the linear fit here in the linear regime above uh, TN, you know, and the estimated U values are plotted here. It shows a nice uh, downward curvature, a symmetric downward curvature. So to kind of uh, uh, to cross check the reliability of our estimation and the choice of this critical regions that is from 2TN to 3TN, 
what we did is we scaled our data with respect to this, uh, you know, uh, repeated parameters here and plotted as a function of temperature. As you can see here, they all the data sets collapse on a single band on single line. This this is a you know very robust uh, uh, signature of uh, uh, of uh, the the or the indication of the reliability of the estimation of U. Though we don't have a direct uh, way to compare our experiment. Oh, five minutes. Okay. So though we don't have a direct way to compare our experimental uh, parameters, you know. But what I have seen is, I mean, people do all the DMRG calculation, uh, density matrix normalization calculation for U and K and compare. Unfortunately, we have not done that yet. But when compared with the other compound, is found our data the shape of U is found to be, uh, you know, close to or uh, exactly similar to uh, that is reported in the strong leg. Uh, spin ladder compound, which shows the repulsive interaction. Well, I think we move on to the mu SR, which is a powerful local flow, and uh, to kind of um, get a better knowledge about uh, the this uh, Tomonaga parameters. And uh, uh, well, I'll skip the introduction to mu SR. I'll just move on to the data. So um, this is the mu SR asymmetry in zero field. It doesn't show any oscillations. It suggests that uh, there is no magnet, no uh, magnetic ordering. Which is consistent with our expectation that our ground state is a singlet ground state. Then we measure the um, NeoSR in the longitudinal field, which uh, can help us kind of to detect the correlations, the effect of correlations. And uh, here, then we fitted to some exponential function and so on, and uh, estimated the NeoSR uh, relaxation rate lambda. And so this is lambda as a function of temperature at different fields. So at one point, four test slides shows a broad. Uh, hump here, likely due to the long range order. Then this peak position shifts toward high temperatures as it expected with field. So we have divided this uh, data set into three regions. One is your long range order region. And this is the region where you have dominant effects from the uh, critical fluctuations um, as you are approaching the magnetic order state. And this is purely your 1D regime, you know, TLL regime, where the spin spin correlation function is expected to follow the power law. So indeed, we try to fit uh, this our data by the power law that is lambda proportional to T to power alpha, where alpha is directly proportional related to K, that is alpha equal to one by two K minus one. So we again choose the same critical region, two TN to three TN region, and the solid lines are the fit. Fits. The estimated K values are plotted here. You can see here these K values are quite consistent with our our um, other. Uh, values you know values estimated from the other experiments okay now again to cross check our reliability of the estimation we have scaled the data with respect to the fitted parameters and you can see here they all the data sets they collapse on top of each other suggesting that this is the tll regime and our estimation of the parameters are more reliable okay so here you know um, uh, these are the values of k obtained from various experiments of course, again, this value can also be estimated from the NMR relaxation time. So here NMR relaxation we have measured. And, uh, um, and uh, what is found here is, you know, this power law fit at high temperature can overestimate the value of K because you have a dominant uh, effect also from this uh, 3D correlations. So recently there was a correction to this power law, this phi term, which was given by Dupin detail, you know, using the random phase approximation and they propose uh, this correction to this, to one over T1, to the power law. And we fitted this expression, this solid line is a fit and perfectly fits and the obtained value of K is here. It very well consistent with the other experiments. Those, this clearly suggests that, you know, we have a uh, repulsive interaction between those spinless formants. And yesterday I was talking to uh, Carlo Peng. So he also pointed out to here that, you know, if the value of K is close to 0.5, and that is suggest that is a Heisenberg spin system. Uh, well, uh, now uh, to conclude, the sodium vanadium phosphate is found to be alternate spin chain compound with a tiny spin gap and with a very small critical field of gap closing. And uh, we found the evidence of uh, BC phase or low temperatures, um, uh, 3D BC phase or low temperatures. And in the gapless regime, that is well above TN, where your 3D couplings have negligible effect or no effect. You know, it shows the signature of TLL physics. So therefore, this will be the first bond alternate spin chain compound 
you know, showing the uh, crossover effect from or crossover physics uh, from 1D to uh, 3D BC, B, BC1. And this is the first alternate spin chain compound showing both the signatures. So I'll end uh, my talk by acknowledging uh, my co-workers. So this work was done by two of my former students, Sohel Islam and Prasan Mukherjee. And these are my collaborators. And uh, the mu star measurements were done with the help of Pavitra Biswas and Mark Telling from ISI UK. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Roesh. Though we are out of time, I can allow a couple of quick questions. Maybe I, okay. I have one, but. Thank you, Ramesh. You have given a lot of job homework for theorists, many things to be thought about. I just wanted to make a remark about your speaker on Ford Kelvin. Mm. I suspect it's also associated with some structural, because this is like a spin pile instability. Yes. So once the gap opens, the structure also will relax. So there may be some elastic anomalies that you may look for around that kind of temperature. Because I think there are similar things in other systems. Uh, the second remark is the TLL is very fascinating. Uh, when you move away from, when you apply larger magnitude and the down spin density becomes smaller, then according to TLL theory, the solitons will carry fractional spin other than half. So there may be some interesting way of testing that prediction. So my question was that uh, uh, you have various estimates of J and J prime, and they are all uh, within some variation. Uh, you have 0.98. So how uh, sure is 0.98 different from one? How can you really say that it is a alternating chain instead of a uniform chain? So uh, if you fit it to uniform chain model, also it fits and give the similar fitting. Okay. So only evidence we have is um, the magnetization where the Magnetization is zero, right? Up to 1.6 Tesla. The gap. Gap. And then when we apply magnetic field, at low fields, we don't see any effect. Okay. Only above two Tesla, we see the field induced ordering. Right. All the measurements were done down to 20 millikilometers. Okay. Thanks. Any? Okay. Works. Yes. Okay. Very nice uh, to see all this data. And uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, so I have uh, several questions, but I will ask one. On I know. Uh, so, uh, about the mu SR, um, I know I, I know you, you look for some challenge a bit. Um, I agree that uh, you see something in your relaxation rate uh, when you apply a field, but uh, even when it's dynamical, you know you can slightly decouple as well uh, your uh, polarization. So I was wondering whether you did the same experiment above the TLL phase you know, like a slightly higher temperature and applying the same fields. Uh, do you see uh, such decoupling also or, uh, or not? So this mu SR equivalent, we had a lot of problems in the analysis. Yeah. Uh, because of the background subtraction and so on. Yeah. And uh, then uh, uh, high temperature data we found somehow not very reliable. Okay. So it's worth comparing, you know, just by eye, seeing the difference when you are, uh, you know, in, uh, in this yeah, yeah. phase that you are studying and, and the one which is above right. the relaxation. And also because our MIOSA time was uh, limited because we measure at different fields, we could not go to high temperatures. Even so, but we are thinking of exploring that side. Yeah. Okay, I think in the interest of time, we have to move on. Let's thank Ramesh again. <laughs>